Okay, in this video I have to apologize in advance. I've uh, committed social media crime and it's going to run on for longer than 20 minutes. I just couldn't edit it uh, down anymore and just keep it coherent and watchable. So please watch it right through to the end and I'm sorry your tiny little attention span is going to be strained but I think you ought to make the effort and watch this. It's either I fragment all these videos into non-existence and non-coherence in which case you won't hear and understand or otherwise I'll try your precious little doom of patience and uh, make you endure the torture of sitting and concentrating for more than 20 minutes so sorry this is longer than the 20 minute I'm so sorry in the last video if you looked down below in the comments section you'll see I put a couple of links to this disinformation campaign that's come out of Yale University uh, in December last December 2018 and I hope you looked at those. Uh, they basically, the first one is uh, really just standard sort of wartime propaganda almost, where they have, you know, like, uh, look, concerned citizen wants to know if the Germans are really nasty. And yes, they're nasty, but we've got this covered. You know, all that kind of bullshit about climate science and uh, the methane bomb in particular. Uh, so, you have to start asking yourself why do why is Yale suddenly in the public service announcement and propaganda industry well they always have been um, they Yale <laughs> okay first I better explain Yale to you because uh, particularly if you're European or English uh, you probably think of Yale University and or the Ivy League universities uh, in general as really uh, kind of posh versions of your polytechnic say in Leeds or something so they're not Leeds poly okay <laughs> these are uh, multi-billion dollars in revenue every year uh, you can't call them corporations um, they they really are non NGOs uh, they're not really supposed to educate they're just finishing schools for um, the apparatchiks that are going to move into the system and take over from the banksters and oilmen. So it is a, basically think of it more like a club for banksters and oilmen. So it's the country club um, that these guys belong to. See, in terms of the Ivy League uh, country clubs, um, it might surprise you, and that's why they like using things like Yale and Harvard as fronts because they have a good reputation. So if you want to bamboozle the public, you basically use your most Incredible mouthpiece and that's you know they're highly respected institutions so that's why they use them but uh, to just you know so you don't have to believe me and say like whoa you know hey dude you haven't been to university so you can't exactly criticize the uh, cream of the crop I don't know that's exactly why I can but here I mean if you if you just want to go and have a look at some facts that, especially for, say, an English person that doesn't really understand this game, uh, it might surprise you that, first of all, that, say, take a politician like Barack Obama, since over his campaign, I think he started his uh, career in the Mafia in about 1999, and uh, during that time, he's, he's actually collected 1.5 billion in bribes. They call them campaign contributions because it sounds so much better than a bribe and it allows America to stay up on the top of the charts in terms of na national ethics instead of you know at the bottom where the United Nations would put them if campaign contributions were just called what they are and that's bribes so basically Barack Obama took 1.5 billion in bribes that might surprise you um, maybe not if you are realist uh, but anyway, all you need to go and look at is his top uh, campaign contributors. Um, the top contributors were the Ivy League universities, uh, Yale and Harvard and, you know, all this crap. Um, so they really just used as a front for public policy to shape perceptions um, and as 
you know, for, forget skull and bones and the Illuminati. I mean, that's just the. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. The, they they really going to go from those Ivy League universities, the insiders within there that will be specially bred to go into, uh, you know, the alphabet soup organizations and stuff like that. So. If you think I'm a nutty, whack job conspiracy theorist just because I say Yale is a front, it's time to catch up. It really is. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so you have to ask yourself, why do they suddenly get into this PSA kind of mode? Um, and it's all, you know, calm down, don't panic, calm down, don't panic. So, right, well. I grew up in South Africa and I've seen a lot of story before because if you live under a totalitarian government, the first thing you know is when the government starts putting out propaganda that says, don't panic everybody, there's only one thing you need to know and that's they've just given you the information that it's time to panic. So yeah, uh, now the second video that's in this uh, kind of, you know, debunking the methane bomb. Okay, let's debunk the debunkers. Uh, right, this, this um, PhD from the US Geological Survey called Carolyn, Carolyn Ruppel. And they haul her out, uh, basically, if you don't know what the US Geological Survey is, the USGS is, is just really a front for the oil industry. They just basically gonna paper over the fact that uh, oil has been oil and natural gas fracking whatever they want to do they're going to go ahead and do it they just paper it over with a few scientific papers and if you're in that game you sell your soul and you go and give them what they want for money and Carolyn Ripple okay so what the hell Yale is doing putting government scientists into a PR video um, yeah, I leave it up to you to figure out, but if you're not in the conspiracy business yet, uh, you really, really have your head very far up your ass. Um, so, okay, so what she's saying about the methane bomb and why you don't have to worry, I can debunk her very quickly. Um, for, she, she only makes a few arguments, they're all weak. The first one is, uh, she underplays how deep the uh, ESAS is, the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. So she maintains and repeats again and again that it's about 150 meters. It's like that is wishful thinking. It's uh, on average 50 meters. So why that's important is she's saying to her colleagues is, uh, you, know, oh, you know, in a column of water of 150 meters, not only is the methohydrates actually uh, under pressure, so they're actually solidified, but by the time the methane bubbled up, I mean, every every high school student in visit has done this experiment. They bubble up a bit of methane, and it just about by the time it gets to the top of a water column, it's dissolved in the water. And so she's appealing to that. Uh, and so she's saying, well, you know, basically it's uh, 150 meters. So you know, by the time the methane bubbles up, it disappears. Now, not only is that a front to basic science, and one of the great gifts of science was the conservation of basically energy and matter. So, where the methane's just supposed to disappear to is uh, not really specified. Obviously, it gets dissolved in the water. Why that's supposed to be okay is debatable. It just really ma makes the process uh, take a little longer. It doesn't change the fact of the process and that's what she's trying to push that's her agenda is to make you not see the facts okay so that's bullshit call that one bullshit about the pressures and stuff like that so then the next one is is truly remarkable she's you she's basically bringing into a question a bit of high school science that you probably you probably know very well okay so what is she saying she's saying she's basically saying that the melting of methyl methane hydrates is a chemical process it's not just melting it's uh, you know basically an endothermic reaction and so because what it means endothermic by the way means that it actually takes energy you have to put energy in to get energy out so it's a net negative so all the sunlight coming in basically it's uh, when it 
cools and melts the methane, what she's saying is the water will actually get cooler. What a load of horseshit. And let me explain to you why. The, I'm sure you, somewhere in summer camp or something, you went, did Smokey Bear told you about the fire triangle and the fact that you need oxygen and fuel and heat uh, to make fire. So what she's trying to say is that, well, the heat actually gets absorbed. So therefore, you can't have fire. Well, to prove her wrong, just go back to Ripley's Believe It or Not and the burning ice. If she's right, you couldn't get a, a block of ice, put a match to it, methane, methane hydrates, clathrates, right? You couldn't put a match to it, get a little bit of it to melt and have it carry on burning and burn down to a puddle. That wouldn't be possible if it was an endothermic reaction. Why? Because of Smoky Bear and the fire triangle. If, it w if that reaction was absorbing more heat than it admitted, in other words it was endothermic, then it couldn't burn, it couldn't be exothermic. So a bit of high school science she's thrown in your face, it's just beggar's belief. Okay, so that's the, the one thing. Then the other point she makes is that, well, the methane hydrates is not as big as people make out. Now this is horseshit. If, if there's one thing that is horseshit in all of that, it's that. Because you can also go and have a look at the corresponding sign of coin. Basically these are just the banksters and the oil men. She's just a mouthpiece for them. So if you want to see the corresponding side of the coin, go and have a look at all the stuff where they want to mine this stuff and um, use it as an energy source. Oh, then the, you'll see that basically they're talking out of the other side of their mouth and then it's just fucking huge and they're fucking everywhere and it's unlimited and it's a hundred gigatons. So Horseshit, horseshit, horseshit. And I think that's pretty much the only three points she makes. The takeaway is just simply don't panic everybody. This methane bomb is conspiracy theorists on the internet. Just remember, doesn't matter what she's saying, you've got to say why is she saying it and why now? Why has Yale got into the panic management business in December. And that's really the only information you know. The rest, their mouths are just moving. So that means they're lying. Okay. Right. Um, so, what I'd really like to talk about is what I promised before, is, and that's global dimming. Right. So here goes. Recently, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, or uh, what the far right often call Alexandria Occasional Cortex, um, I'm beginning to feel the same thing. Uh, she's recently come out with her Green New Deal, uh, basically thinking in terms of Roosevelt from the New Deal of the 1930s. Um, and of course, there are going to be jobs. Yes, uh, we love jobs. Oh, we love jobs. We love jobs to death. Okay. If you have a look at a Green New Deal, uh, there's something strange in it, and that it's. Uh, you have a look at it, but it's it's really. Uh, she's read the IPCC six report, apparently very recently, and she's all out to do end civilization in 12 years. She doesn't know that because she doesn't know much about anything, but she uh, wants to basically put planes on the ground. International flights? We don't know. Uh, but anyway, th that's not the point. The point is, uh, she wants to shut down all these carbon emission sources in the great golden calf, the economy. Uh, she leaves one particular one out, and that is coal-fired power stations. Now, I suspect that that was done for a reason. It's a glaring omission. And I suspect that somebody who drafted some of this bullshit is, uh, actually knows about global dimming. Um, and so they left out the coal-fired power stations. Now, why? Well, if you even got close to what uh, AOC and a um, Green New Deal is trying to do, it would be fatal. Basically, whatever time we have left, they'd be cutting it off 
way shorter than just letting things uh, ride. And by letting things ride, I mean letting the economy just carry on in all its capitalist and heinous structural violence. So here's the reason. Um, if you shut down those coal-fired uh, power stations that are now producing most of the world's power, uh, the first thing that would happen is all the pollution and sulfates would fall out of the air. That would be catastrophic. Um, they'd fall out very quickly on the order of three days or so. And why it would be catastrophic is because the global dimming uh, the effect of global dimming would disappear. So, if you watch the previous uh, video that I put a link to in the comments section of two videos back about the McPherson Paradox, and I hope you did watch that, um, you will see that the global warming effect has been really uh, in opposition to a cooling effect from pollution. So, the cooling effect from really sulfates in the atmosphere uh, is very, very dramatic. So very small amounts of sulfates in the atmosphere, we're talking about 0.5% uh, changes can, you know, move the global temperature two degrees. Um, so what these have been doing is they've been masking the global warming effect all along. So while we've had our, we've been pedal to the metal with carbon, uh, we've had our foot flat on the carbon accelerator. We've also had our left foot on the brakes. So no wonder the car and the weather is skidding all over the place. But the brakes have been global dimming. And what it means is that the pollution really reduces the intensity of sunlight on the Earth's surface. So, uh, think of it just just like uh, your solar panels are not getting as much energy as they could because there's this shield of pollution in the air. Um, so if you take that pollution away, your solar panels will start revving up like crazy. And you know those solar panels are the Earth, so the Earth will start warming up like crazy. Um, if you remember back in the 70, this is an old solved problem. You see, this is the problem why you can't think linearly and why it's linear thinking is going to be the death of us, uh, along with thinking in terms of frames and in, in terms of not understanding linear and exponential processes. Those, those three things are the things that are going to wipe out our human race. So, okay, uh, the old solved problem from the 1970s, uh, which I would have lived through as a boomer, but if you're, you're in the doomer generation, uh, you probably don't know about this. And when it's filtered, when it comes through to you, um, it's filtered in a very strange way. So climate denialists, basically guys in pay of the oil industry, they, they will say, they, there's this kind of meme amongst them that they say, well, oh, well, only a few decades ago, uh, climate scientists were predicting that there were, we were heading for a new ice age. And then rather embarrassed climate scientists come out and say, no, no, if you look at the majority of the papers that were coming out, the majority of them say warming. Uh, there are very few that say uh, dimming or basically we're heading for another ice age. Now, why? Okay. Let's go back to those papers that uh, say we were heading for an ice age. Uh, they were correct because those papers balance out the warming effect. Um, and they had a big impact at the time. All governments started reducing pollution apart from China, which couldn't really help it in terms of growth. They have to give the population jobs to keep them docile. So, they they in their own kind of trap in, in China, so they couldn't avoid putting out masses of uh, pollution, and they, they still do. But here's the thing, it's considered a solved problem, and we've just moved on from that. Now, here's where it's going to come back to bite us, because the Green New Deal will get its wish. All those power stations, all the planes, they will eventually be grounded, but not for a good reason, not because you voted for 
Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, it's because basically the system's going to fall apart. So those uh, power stations won't be able to get the fuel to, to run uh, to run on and then they will shut down the particulate will come out of the atmosphere and then uh, you know basically within a few days uh, we'll be in serious trouble so it's a catch-22 we're damned if we do we don't damned if we don't if we carry on running this civilization uh, it's going to emit co2 and sulfates and it has to carry on running because if we stop doing that uh, it'll be a, c a catastrophic heating. So we need, it's actually providing a cooling effect and a heating effect. Now, where did all those papers came from in the 70s that said, oh, we're heading for an ice age? It's worth clarifying. And if you're a climate scientist, it's worth knowing this uh, as a rebuttal when climate deniers mention them. Okay, what those, the, what those papers were saying was a couple of things. One of them is the dimming effect is very dramatic so as I mentioned it's very sensitive to the amount of sulfates in particular in an aerosol in the air so the dimming can be upwards of 80% the sunlight blocked out I mean if you you're talking about fog you know it's kind of like uh, pea soup fog in, in London so very dense and very easy to block out the Sun now here's the bit that uh, you ought to know is a uh, Duma climate scientist is that there were papers at the time that ran these scenarios that were feedback loops just like the feedback loops we've talked about and the runaway exponential growth uh, scenarios in the Arctic now for warming they figured out that there are similar things for cooling so what they figured out is is as you get a dimming effect from pollution it makes more precipitation it makes more snow now what they found is the more snow you get they ran this in models and I think that they actually had more proof than that but it's well established but forgotten that the there was runaway cooling so the more snow there was the more snow and precipitation that caused and we quickly run away to an ice age so that's that was the runaway cooling scenario that everybody's forgotten and that's what those papers were warning about so now when everybody just focuses you know the move the frame and this is why framing is going to kill us frame has gone from global cooling to global warming uh, the, the global cooling never went away um, but now it's crucial uh, because it's a balance to the global warming it can't overcome the global warming in the 70s there were papers when they realized there's global warming they're now papers which are probably not cited anymore and kind of forgotten where they said well you know we know there's global warming maybe we just chuck out sulfates like crazy into the atmosphere and uh, you know we can manage the warming okay first of all this is crazy shit one th if you're looking at runaway cooling in one direction and runaway warming from this is commercial activity capitalism and civilization is basically in a sensitive dependence on runaway warming and runaway cooling the obvious lesson is don't fuck with this system no we're much smarter than that and we have agency so we can control this and it's fucking lunacy because you're gonna do one or the other so an example is this Green New Deal. If Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gets her way, she will make runaway warming. Now, if you get geoengineers to have their way, they'll put, they'll do something stupid like put sulfates or ramp up coal-fired power stations. That would be cool. Uh, just to mitigate something like the methane bomb in the Arctic. Now, if you uh, a boomer and you remember all the disaster scenarios from the cooling scenarios they were we you know gonna get crop failures because of the cold cold is a lot worse in terms of crop failures than heat actually if you if you look at the uh, the year without a summer uh, that was basically from Mount Pinatubo um, or Krakatoa one of the two 
But anyway, when that blew, the effect of global dimming from all the particulate from uh, the volcano uh, went right round the earth and there was uh, no summer. In, uh, in London, the Thames froze. They actually had carnivals in, in summer and, you know, roasted oxes on the ice in the Thames. So the crop failures were far more devastating from the cold uh, than from the heat. They, from the heat is implies uh, drought and you can mitigate it by irrigation. There's nothing you can do with the cold. So, um, yeah, you can't put a coat on the, on the, on the crops or, or, you know, have a heater in, in, in front of them. I mean, that again would be insane management of a, of a system that isn't actually manageable. So, okay, so that dimming effect and um, runaway has kind of been forgotten. It's time to recover that memory because it just shows you how screwed we are. We can't stop this train, uh, the train of civilization, this golden calf that you worship. We can't stop it and we can't not stop it. And that's the real reason why we are fucked. So let's imagine putting, you know, a geoengineering scenario now. Let's imagine ramping up coal-fired power stations and then yay maybe they can power the scrubber hooray <laughs> and they will go there they are that stupid but okay so someone's gonna gonna go there you know that uh, and they're gonna have a phd behind their name it's a definite so okay so right okay if you put sulfates into the atmosphere like that uh you will find that it's a worse scenario um, than a death by the methane bomb. Um, first of all, to die of pollution, you've seen people in, in China, in the industrial zones in China, and how they've been uh, suffering from basically breathing poisoned air. Uh, humans can't live in poisoned air like that, and it's probably a nasty way to go. Um, probably in the ranks of nasty ways to go. Starvation would probably be up at the top. Um, and then dying of a respiratory uh, disease or respiratory poisoning from pollution would, would be a nasty death too. So, you can't pollute the atmosphere in order to save us from the methane bomb. That's uh, just not going to happen. Um, and so, besides putting all those sulfates up would cause acidification. The other problem that's been solved, you remember, is acid rain. So the acidification in the, uh, the sea has killed off the barrier reef. That's gone now. It's, uh, it's dead. So the planet really probably can't survive without the barrier reef and the Amazon rainforest. Both of them are as good as dead. Um, so yeah, go... Um, Green New Deal, hooray! Next, next insanity, please come on stage. Now personally, I'm hoping that our owners and minders do come out with more of these uh, propaganda videos trying to debunk uh, basic science, because I think it's a complete own goal. The more they come out with them, the more they expose themselves, the more the public actually comes to realize that something is going on and it's serious. Uh, otherwise, why bother to, you know, just basically put out counter-propaganda uh, against people like me and other realists that are just coming out and saying, um, guys, uh, it's time to wake up. So, if they're saying, oh, there are all these conspiracy theorists out on the internet, uh, it's like, yeah, great, they always have been. Why is it suddenly concerning you? Why? Make a few more of those videos, please. I hope you get millions of hits. And I hope people finally start to think. That would be the own goal. If they accidentally make you start questioning and thinking, all those public service announcements, all that government pre-wartime propaganda will basically come to nothing. So, yeah. Pass the word around. It's time. Not for us to panic, it's time for them to panic because they know that we know.